good evening. Good evening. And uh, it's great to see you on this last of the three weekends in this particular uh, sequence of lectures. And uh, tonight we're moving, this last semester we did Gospels and, and Acts, and this semester we've been doing uh, Paul's letters. And tonight we move on to a part of the Bible that for a lot of people, you know, a lot of people that are doing well to know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Statistically, most people in the United States can't name the four Gospels, but a lot of church people can. And then a lot of church people kind of know something about Paul, and they know something about maybe, who knows, Romans, Philippians, Ephesians. Most people have kind of a favorite Pauline book. But ask people to start with Hebrews and name the rest of the books of the New Testament. And you'll probably be asking a long time to find somebody, even in church, that can do that. And the problem is that uh, every one of those books covers ground either that no other book covers or that no other book covers so well. So some of these little obscure books that people have never studied, like Jude. Who's ever studied Jude? Well, there's quite a message in the book of Jude, and it's an especially important message for times like we're living in. So between tonight and tomorrow, we're going to be starting with Hebrews, and then we're going to move forward into all of what's called the, uh, the general epistles, or sometimes they're called the Catholic epistles, not because they're associated with the Roman Catholic Church, but because the word Catholic with a small c means universal or, or generally applicable. And these are letters that are not written like to the Ephesians or to Philemon or to the Romans, but tend to be written more to a large number of churches or just churches in general, like the book of Hebrews. So you're going to be like the, uh, the craftsman who has a toolbox who actually knows what's in it. I mean, if you're a Christian, you have a toolbox, it's called the Bible. But a lot of people don't know what's in their toolbox. And this is some of the less frequently used tools we're looking at, but uh, still very important ones. And to focus our thoughts, I would like to call your attention to the first two verses of Hebrews, which say, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And you can start with uh, certainly Abraham, although in his way, Noah was a prophet, and move forward all the way to Malachi, and you've got um, close to 2,000 years of God speaking to his people, to the world, by uh, specially empowered individuals, prophets. So that's what was, but he says in Hebrews 1, 2, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, through whom, excuse me, whom he appointed the heir of all things. And of course, the heir of things is the person to whom those things ultimately belong. So he's saying this world belongs to God who has designated his son as the heir. So what's, what's life about? What's the, where's life headed? Well, it's headed to the lordship of the son. He's the heir. And it says, through whom also he created the world. Where did this all come from? Well, God made it, and he made it through the Son. So Hebrews starts out by saying, in terms of the origin of things, and in terms of the goal of things, it all revolves around the Son. And uh, that's a good thought for us to pause and go to prayer with right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for every book of sacred scripture. Thank you for the opportunity we've had in recent weeks and months to read it afresh and ponder it anew. Thank you for revealing so much to us for the sake of your son, and thank you for the assurance that things are headed in his direction, and thank you that uh, along with him being heir to all things, we know that through faith we are co-heirs with him, as we learn from Paul in Romans chapter 8. 
and we pray that you would help us to rejoice in that tonight and that you would open our minds and our hearts to a fuller recognition of your presence around us and before us and within us. And we want to pray especially for the funeral ministries going on this weekend as part of this church and pastoral staff, and we ask your blessing on Pastor Sloan and others, and we pray that they would be uh, enabled to uh, mediate your comfort to those in their uh, highest need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you have your handout. If you don't, it's on the back table there. And uh, we know that the whole Bible is about the... Gospel. But the good news. Christ has come. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ is coming again. You know, there's the gospel. And just add in there, what are you going to do about it? Because part of the gospel message is always an appeal to people. Uh, repent and be saved. Something like that. So you have in your handout this summary that I've uh, entrusted to you. Hoping now this is the sixth night that many of us have been together in the last six months or seven months. Um, I hope you'll take away from our time together uh, an, under, an integrated understanding of the Bible. You know, the Bible contains all kinds of things. You know, Adam and Eve and the fall of Jerusalem in 587 and Saul and the judges and Isaiah. You know, it's just a, a kaleidoscope so that you could be asked, well, what's the Bible about? You say, well, I don't know. It's about so many things. But hopefully, you've got an integrated understanding, and you know it's about the good news of Jesus Christ, and then you can break that down. So if wherever you go in the Bible, you've got kind of a little lamp to light your way. The Old Testament is the preparation, preparation for the gospel. The gospels are the manifestation. manifestation of the gospel. Acts is the... Expansion. expansion of that good news. The epistles are the explanation, explanation and revelation is the consummation. consummation of the good news. So it's good news all around. And uh, some of you know that uh, when we were here together last, it was uh, Friday, Saturday. That was three weeks ago. And uh, two weeks ago tonight, I was uh, flying to Dakar, Senegal, and then uh, one week ago tonight, this is Friday, right? One week ago tonight, I was still in Pretoria, South Africa, and I spent uh, from a Sunday through a Saturday, that's seven days, uh, mainly teaching. Uh, I preached on Sunday morning, but the rest of the time it was teaching in two different cities, Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, Pretoria, South Africa places where many things are going on that pertain to the gospel, largely because, um, as I don't think I shared here, but I'll share now, whereas in North America, you know, I, I read nine churches out of ten are either stagnant or decreasing in size, and we don't see, you know, noticeable renewal and revival in churches. I mean, good things happen. God's faithful. But um, statistically, Christianity's not growing in North America. But in Africa, and, and the, the figures of the you know, religious uh, experts go out to about 2050 right now, both on the Catholic side and the Protestant side, uh, Christianity is, is continuing to explode exponentially, so that whereas right now, 2017, of the Protestants of the world, and you know, in this room we, we count as Protestants, 12% um, of the Protestants of the world are in North America right now. 16% in Europe. 18% in Asia. 41% in Africa. That's how many more Protestants there are right now in Africa than there are in the United States. And uh, give it till 2050, North America will be 8% of the Protestants of the world, unless you know something happens that 
we kick in the afterburner here and you know, lots of people come to faith. Um, Europe will move down to 12% of the world's cross population. Asia will lose 1%, which basically they'll stay stable relative to world population growth. But Africa will have 53% of the world's Protestants by 2050. So if we were offering this class in Africa, there probably would be 10 times as many people here. Whereas, um, you know, you're the lunatic fringe <laughs> in North America. People who would show up on Friday night to talk about Hebrews <laughs> and First Peter. Um, you know, it's, it's not the done thing in North America. But it should be, because Hebrews is such a great book. And I've got uh, some information on page one of your handout. Now, I haven't done this hardly at all in dealing with New Testament books, but traditionally, this is how academicians deal with New Testament books. They look at what are called introductory issues. So those are, those are kind, of, kind, of, kind of a journalist question. Uh, who, what, where, why, when? So who wrote, wrote Hebrews? And the fact is, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. And it didn't used to be uh, a critical question because for most of its history, for practical purposes, if you asked a church person who wrote a book, basically the answer would be God. I mean, the Bible is the word of God. And it uh, doesn't mean the human author is totally irrelevant, but it means that compared to how important it is that God stands behind scripture, the human writer is not that significant. But if you've read around in your uh, encountering the New Testament, especially if you've read the chapters that I don't think are assigned, but beginning with about chapter 10, there are chapters on hermeneutics and historical Jesus studies and the history of biblical criticism and so forth. If you read those chapters, you'll see that, especially by around the year 1800, uh, scholars a minority of them at first, but every generation they came to be more and more in the, in the majority. They decided that the Bible really was no more the word of God than any other ancient religious, any, yeah, any other ancient religious book. And uh, it was just the works of men, the writings of men. And so this question of human authorship became much more important because divine authorship essentially was canceled out. So, um, just because we ask a human author question, it doesn't mean we don't believe in the Bible, but I'm just explaining why today that's a very big question for some people. And uh, for us, it's an interesting question and a worthwhile question, but nothing stands or falls on, uh, say, the book of Hebrews if we don't know who wrote it. Tertullian suggested Barnabas wrote it. Luther suggested Apollos wrote it. John Calvin suggested Luke because there are a lot of terms of phrase or, or uh, expressions in uh, Hebrews that it's thought maybe Luke put into Greek formulations that came from Paul. So in this view, maybe Paul stands behind Hebrews and then Luke put it uh, from Hebrew or Aramaic into Greek. In the 1800s in England, Henry Alford suggested Aquila wrote it. Adolf von Harnack, not to be outdone, said, well, how about Priscilla? And then uh, recently, a scholar in Texas named Dan Wallace suggested that maybe Barnabas and Apollos stand behind um, Hebrews. Origen, who was a third to fourth century uh, church father, like most of the Greek-speaking early fathers, said it wasn't Paul that wrote it because they read Greek. And when they read Paul's 13 letters and then read Hebrews, they said whoever wrote Hebrews didn't write these 13 letters. But by that time, it was traditional in the early church to ascribe it to Paul. And he said, well, you know, OK, whatever you want to think, but really only God knows. Only God knows. So no matter how, how far you back you go, there's not a strong consensus on who wrote the book of Hebrews. Now, in English-speaking circles, there's often a strong consensus because the King James said the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews. But um, that's not part of the earliest manuscripts. That's something that was put in there 
later on by church tradition. Letter B, you see why the early church, uh, well, you see that the early church said it was apostolic in content, and people have pointed to five different reasons why it doesn't seem like a Pauline letter. You know, every other Pauline letter we have starts with Paul. That's the first word, Paul. To so-and-so, to Timothy, to the Romans, whatever. And Hebrews starts like that. So it doesn't mean Paul couldn't have written it in itself, but it does mean if he did write it, it's not, you know, it's different than the other 13 writings that he undoubtedly did write. As to date, some say it must have been written before 70 AD because uh, it talks a lot about the temple service and in a way says it's superseded. And that would be a pretty good argument for being superseded if it had been destroyed. Um, it's not a conclusive argument, but most people, well, I won't say most because I haven't done a study, you know, like 52%, 87%. Um, a lot of scholars will, will say it, it was written before AD 70. And what happened in AD 70? Jerusalem was destroyed. As Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, not one stone will be left standing on another. Page two. It was, it's written to people under duress. And it makes, I think, a lot of sense to understand these people as believers in Judea. And uh, it could be boring to go on and on and on with these introductory questions. So I'll, I'll refer you to that, uh, Roman numeral three, then Roman numeral four. Uh, since it doesn't say dear so-and-so at the beginning, which in an ancient letter would have the writer's name, um, it doesn't, when you pick it up, it's, it's not a letter. It's not a traditional Greek language letter. It does call itself a word of exhortation. In 1322 of Hebrews, it says, uh, thank you for, for bearing with this word of exhortation, as I've written briefly. I don't think it's really that brief, but uh, in Acts 13, 15, that same word appears, and Paul and Barnabas are in a synagogue, and the scripture's read, and then they say to the visitors in that synagogue, they say, if, if you have a word of exhortation, please share it. And then Paul gets up and preaches a sermon. So that term in Greek, word of exhortation, probably is uh, a term meaning sermon, and that's probably what um, the book of Hebrews is. Think of it as a sermon to a group of believers. And you know, I, I think you, you won't be far off the mark. It's a high literary style, like Luke and Acts, both are high literary style. And a lot of the words that are used, the expressions that are used, put scholars in mind of a certain writer who was a Jewish writer who wrote in the first century in uh, Alexandria, Egypt. His name was Philo. So people have made comparisons between the writing of the writer of Hebrews and the writer, uh, the Jewish writer Philo. That's why it's sometimes called Alexandrian in tone. Now we get to the interesting part. If you read the letter and you say, what, what is this written for? What, what's, what's the issue that the writer is uh, addressing? You can surmise plausibly that he writes to some people who had become Christians. That is, they were confessing Jesus as the Messiah. But they were wavering. And in their wavering, they were thinking, maybe we took a wrong turn. Maybe we need to go back to where we started and uh, reaffirm our old faith. Remember what Jesus said about putting your hand to the plow and looking back? Yeah. That's kind of what they may have been threatening to do. And so the writer says things to them like, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 
and let's consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So some have quit getting together, even as Christians. Some are wavering. And he says, let's pull back from pulling back. And then he commends them. He says, remember the former days when you were enlightened and you, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. So these Christians uh, came under persecution and they, they stood up for each other. Remember when Jesus was arrested, all the disciples fled. And often there's a danger of guilt by association when, uh, when security calls. But he says, you had compassion on those in prison. You didn't forget about them. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Since you know that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. You know, one of the things that's happened in our recent lifetimes in the Middle East is there are large Christian communities and they've been overrun by jihadists. And one of the first things they do is plunder everything. And this was going on in the first century when uh, Christian communities would emerge or when, when households would, would convert in a Jewish majority area. Uh, people might be driven from their, their homes. People would lose their jobs. People would be disowned. You know, if they were a son or a daughter, they, they would lose their family status and then their stuff would be taken. And that's what's being described here. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence there's a certain confidence. Uh, Janis Joplin put it this way, uh, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Right? If you're really old, you remember that song, <laughs> Me and Bobby McGee. And uh, these were people who were so committed to Christ that nothing else mattered when push came to shove. So they had a confidence which carries its own great reward. And he exhorts them to endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For, and then he cites a biblical text that constitutes a promise to them, yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. In other words, God's going to return and set, set things straight, sort things out. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So a little promise in verse 37, a little threat in verse 38. But in verse 39, he says, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So Hebrews is written to encourage people who feel like you and I do sometimes. A little shaky. Or maybe we reach out to people who haven't yet really found their groove in the Christian walk. And, uh, you know, we know these folks, they're in church for a while, and maybe they're sort of you know, on fire for the Lord, and then it's like, where are they? Uh, and sometimes people just flat turn away. Well, he's writing to people to try to stabilize them in their faith. And he does this, and, and this is the main reason why people who read Hebrews say, well, it must have been written to Jewish background believers. Because his whole argument is that Christ, and you know, go back to the first verses we read there, how Hebrews starts out on the note of the Son. It's a, it's a profoundly and comprehensively Christological book. Everything relates to Christ. But it's not Christ in the abstract, or it's not a, uh, some philosophical Christ. It's a Christ who fulfilled what God instituted in the Old Testament to be a means of grace to his people. And that's what I mean there on your handout, the institutions of Judaism. You know, I'm not talking about uh, uh, buildings and organizations per se. When you hear institution, you can think of 
lots of things, but I'm thinking about what God instituted, what he ordained, what he made provisions for in the Old Testament, like the Torah. You know, he came down on Mount Sinai and gave tablets to Moses. He, he instituted something there. He gave Moses directions for the tabernacle. He provided directions for the temple later on. So there are things that God instituted. The priesthood. He ordained that Aaron and his sons would be priests. And then the, the Levites would be priests. Who, who, who decided all this? Did they vote? No. God said this is the way it's going to be. You know, here it is on a platter for you. And these were all great things. These were all great things. And uh, many, many, and I don't know how to put a number on it, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people from the time of Abraham forward and, and, and also before Abraham. I mean, Enoch knew the Lord. He called on the Lord. I think Adam and Eve repented and, you know, had a saving relationship with God. But all through the Old Testament, God instituted things so that by promise, they would have fellowship with him, both now and in the age to come. Remember how Jesus said that uh, uh, the sons, basically the, the Jewish people that were always trying to take him down, he said, uh, basically many Gentiles will dine with Abraham in the age to come, but the sons of Abraham will be cast out in outer darkness. You know, he's saying that um, Abraham's going to be in heaven. And lots of people in the Old Testament are going to be in heaven. Um, and the reason they're going to be in heaven is because God instituted ways in the Old Testament for them to be there. Or another image you know, that's pretty obvious is Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration who appears with him? Elijah. Moses Elijah. and Elijah. Well, where did they get beamed in from? <laughs> well, presumably from, from God's heavenly presence. I don't think they were burning in Sheol. So, so they, were, they were with the Lord, whatever the particulars of that are. And I know it's to say that the, the, the Old Testament is a glorious manifestation of the grace of God in the world to his people. But it's all what we call anticipatory. You know, it's all leading up to something greater. And the, uh, the fizz, if I can use that word, you know, like an alka seltzer? The fancy word for that is efficacy. But the fizz of the Old Testament, the, the thing that, that makes it boil with, with hope is the promised one, the coming one, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. And all through the Old Testament, people are saved in retrospect. In re is that right? No, in prospect. Retrospect is a little bit. In, in prospect. They're looking ahead. They're anticipating something. And whatever means in the Old Testament God used to do a great work like angels, like the priesthood, like the sacrifice, all those things are fulfilled in Christ and therefore they're superseded by Christ. Doesn't mean they're not good, doesn't mean they were bad, doesn't mean they were inferior, it just means that they've been superseded. There's been a change, a change in the guard, so to speak. And we'll talk more about that in five minutes. Thank you.